So, hello and welcome to this Intelligence Squared podcast with me, Carmilla. We are recording this on November the 12th, so that's just a week after the US 2020 election. I'm delighted to welcome our guest, Ruth ben Giat, historian and author of Strong Men, How They Rise, Why They Succeed, How They Fall. Ruth, hello. Hi, thanks for having me on. So Ruth, um, question number one, could you paint the like idealized strong man for us? Like what, what does what does kind of, you know, the, the, the perfect strong man look like? You know, Gaddafi's sexual appetites, Stalin's enthusiasm for a secure co-bureaucracy, you know, what, 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 what would you in your mind's eye see a strong man as, as perfectly being? So I'm using the term uh, and the, 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 the men in my book are all successful strongmen rulers, um, at least the 20th century ones, for, to refer to a type of authoritarian or authoritarian tending ruler who um, definitely exerts executive power, destroys the, or damages democracy, but also has this kind of macho bluster and personal relationships with uh, other male despots often come to influence uh, national and foreign policy. And in general, a strongman is somebody who exercises what I call a personalist form of rule. And his personal quirks, character, financial needs, uh, other such things uh, come to dominate national and foreign policy. He domesticates the judiciary, domesticates his party. So the strongman is a man who is uh, highly seductive to many, highly brutal, and these two things go together. So what is the relationship between a strong man as a kind of ruler and authoritarianism as a form of government? Are they, are they necessarily have to both be present in order for a strong man to truly be able to exercise their kind of appetites and proclivities? So the, the book looks, I felt it was time to step back and look at a uh, hundred years of, of, of authoritarianism. And there are three phases. There's the fascist phase, there's the military coup phase. So I have Gaddafi, there's Mobutu, Pinochet in Chile. And then there's what I call new authoritarians. And uh, authoritarianism kind of uh, evolves over a century. And strong men rulers, I see them as a subset of authoritarians. They're, they're always personalist rulers. And so for example, uh, there were lots of military juntas during the Cold War, but Pinochet in Chile was the one who immediately exercised personal power. Uh, you know, he, patronage networks all depended on him. So they're a subset of ruler, but it also evolves over a century because today authoritarians and strongmen, they get in by elections and they manipulate elections to stay there. So the pioneer there was Berlusconi in Italy, who definitely, uh, he never destroyed democracy, of course, but he controlled the media, he owned TV networks, and he ended up wrapping uh, the, the state and the legal structure around his own financial and personal needs. Mm. You used a really, a really interesting phrase, I think, to describe the kind of opening of this third chapter in the kind of historical epochs of, of strong men, you know, an illiberal evolution of democratic politics. Um, you, you chart the beginning of that, I believe, as around 1990. Is, is that right? And, and kind of what, what do you think began to happen then to kind of begin to usher us into this, into this third phase we, we're beginning to live through now? I mean, it's the end of the Cold War. And, and I should say that because I'm looking mostly at um, people who destroyed or damaged a democracy, I don't have communists. I'm not, looking, I'm not looking at communist leaders. So there's no Stalin, there's no Mao, although there's a lot of attention when they influence right-wing strongmen. So the end of the Cold War allowed for the rise of a new right wing. Um, and a new phase of authoritarianism, but it's also a new phase of media and, it, and, you, and you get people who again are, there's fewer one party states today outside of communist um, countries like North Korea and China. And so things evolve in a different manner. Um, if you think of Putin and Erdogan and Orban and over the time I've written this book, over, it took a few years to write the book, uh, many of those who are now ruling have consolidated their power, like Orban, who now rules by decree, but they came in through elections um, and they, it took them a while 
uh, to, to amass this amount of power. So today it's evolution and not revolution in the strongman world. Well, talking of elections, I don't think that we can go any further uh, without talking about the one we've just had, and of course, Trump. Um, so, uh, Ruth, um, how neatly does Trump fit within this definition of a strongman? So I live in America, and uh, one of the impetus for writing this book was in 2015-16, I saw Trump start to have rallies with loyalty oaths. He started to threaten violence uh, when he said I could stand on Fifth Avenue and shoot someone. And of course, this is the kind of threats that you know Bolsonaro made in Brazil and Duterte made while they were candidates. So I started to track Trump as a kind of strongman figure. And again, you have, the, you have Berlusconi, who uh, was also a strongman figure in democracy. Trump is far more dangerous. So what we're going through now uh, is the logical and very predictable extension of his behavior that he set up very successfully all doing his first term. He's had four years uh, to completely domesticate the GOP. It's really, it's really his tool, his personal tool, which is all the more uh, astonishing because men like Berlusconi or, or Mussolini they formed their own parties. Or you think of Orban, who they, were, they had a leadership role in their parties for many years. Trump came from outside and he still managed to uh, have this loyalty uh, code and this corruption. He, you know, he made them co-conspirators. So they stuck with him through everything. And the GOP is the conservative elite equivalent of those groups who uh, backed Hitler and Mussolini to come to power. And so you always see these figures, these conservative elites, these political elites. So what we see now is that he's refusing to uh, acknowledge the results of the election and his personality cult and his propaganda machine have so far carried him through. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I thought we might use Trump as a microcosm to talk about the kind of three phases in a kind of strong man's career, you know, the winning of power, then the use of it, and then finally the loss of it. So, um, to, you, you know, to, to, to what extent then do, do you think kind of Trump's capture of power, you know, and I'm thinking here, especially of the, that fateful 2016 campaign and the way that he kind of built himself this kind of incredible kind of insurgent momentum to take on the incumbents within the Republican Party. To what extent is that kind of iconic and, and characteristic of the way in which strongmen normally catapult themselves into the kind of highest echelons of government? So one of the things that um, was truly uh, eye-opening to me was that, you know, so the, the book is an attempt to show certain patterns in all of these phases. Um, and it's actually an, the, the, the body of the book is an exploration of the tools of rule, corruption, propaganda, machismo, <clears throat> incitements to violence or violence. And so again, things work differently in the 21st century for some aspects. Um, Trump didn't have the violence that Mussolini had, but you have this dynamic where the outsider comes in, <clears throat> he's clearly an extremist. He talks about, in his case, he talks about violence and he's let into the system by elites who want to, for, they think they can use him and then he'll calm down if he gets into government. I call this the pivot delusion, or they called him a clown and they thought they could tame him and use him. And this was of course the fallacy with Hitler and Mussolini and even Pinochet in Chile, although it was a coup, there were Christian Democrats who supported him because they thought that he would restore order, get rid of Allende, the socialist, and then have a return to democracy. And of course that was tragically wrong. So over and over again, these men behave the same way. And one of the, uh, very unfortunately for us in America and actually the whole world, Trump's personality, his, his temperament maps on 100% to those of rulers past. The outcome is different today, but the aspirations and the uh, style of rule because of character, including the refusal to leave office, um, is exactly the same. And in terms of the use of power, then, um, that a once a strong man is is in power, um, I, I, you point to kind of propaganda and virility and corruption as, as these main major attributes. But but I, I want you to talk about um, spectacle 
Because there seems to be this kind of incredible draw to spectacle that strong men have, you know, whether it's Trump's wall or Gaddafi's tent city or, you know, giant golden statues. Why are they so drawn to it? One thing I've found is that almost all of the men who have success, because there's lots of, you know, men who are around who are liberal figures, but the ones who have success often have a background in spectacle uh, or media. Uh, Mobutu uh, was a journalist as well as Mussolini. Um, of course, Hitler, Hitler actually, and maybe your, your listeners know this, um, he, you know, he was a very, he was a big fan of Mussolini and he studied him very closely, but Hitler couldn't get to power for a decade. You know, he had his putsch and then he went to jail. So he took hypnotism lessons, he took acting lessons and voice lessons, and he practiced his spectacle, his gestures that became famous in front of a mirror during the 1920s. So all of these men, and of course, Berlusconi was the master of television, and we have Donald Trump, who was a real reality television star. All of them are highly attentive to how they present themselves, how they use their bodies, and how they seduce followers. So one of the things that was, you know, the many red flags about Trump was his skill in uh, forging these bonds with his followers and their emotional bonds. It's not just about obeying him, it's about making them feel part of something. And this was the movement. And this is buoying him through this illegal uh, maneuvers he's trying to do now to discredit our election. 70 million Americans, more than that, voted for him despite his criminal mismanagement of the pandemic. And that is a testament to his skill at staging these spectacles. When you, when you think about um, strong men, how do you navigate this kind of strange dualism of like skill and madness? Because it seems that they, they you know, you, you, your descriptions of them both kind of recognize their adroitness uh, being able to, yeah, manage, you know, large populations and their own image and, you know, exploit crises and act decisively. But at the same time, it, it, it feels like almost exclusively the strong men that you deal with are literally insane at the same moment. <laughs> you know, they're, they're, I don't see them as insane. They're, they're, many of them are criminals, of course, and, and come to uh, power with a criminal record. And then uh, if they're ruling in a democracy uh, like Berlusconi and Trump, the, the governance becomes about uh, damage control. So we can differentiate those kinds of figures from you know, people who had one party dictatorships. De definitely one of, the, one of the things I do in the corruption chapter is look not only at their financial con corruption, but how they establish this divide and rule, how they, how they structure their governance uh, in ways that allow them to have total power. So they're hiring and firing people constantly. Gaddafi, for example, he, he was energized by chaos. And so, one of the macro themes um, is that although we're led to think that authoritarianism is a productive form of government, it's efficient, um, it's good for business. Uh, Trump, may, you know, Mussolini made the trains run on time. What I show, and there are more and more studies coming out by economists on this, is that it's a highly destructive and chaotic form of government. Uh, there's so much waste, not only human waste from um, from violence and people being imprisoned, but also the formation of large communities of exiles who are business owners and other people who have invested in their country for decades and have to leave the country. So there's capital, there's capital flight, there's all kinds of negative um, you know, outcomes that, that we've been too influenced by uh, American PR firms who work for authoritarians, authoritarians own propaganda, to fully grasp the magnitude of this destruction they cause. And, and here it does relate back to their very, um, their very kind of irascible and impulsive temperament. And so the book is an arc, it goes from their rule, their, their ascent to power, but it shows how they're, in some cases, they're their own worst enemies because the systems that they set up are counterproductive and lead them to make bad decisions and then uh, they fall. Well, we're going to get to the fall in a second, because I think that's especially what we all have to deal with at the moment. But but before we do, um, I just wanted to briefly talk about crisis, because um, mm. that, that seems to have an especially important kind of role in the kind of, you know, as a punctuation point and a tool in the in the um, in the lives and careers of strong men. Um, how important is it and, and how 
worried should we be about about coronavirus now as being another opportunity for strong men across the world not just trump to to kind of see this as a moment which they where they can really extend power in ways which they weren't able to before strong men thrive on crisis and it can be any kind of crisis and ideally they're uh, helping to create a crisis and then they weaponize it and exploit it to in influence their power so whenever you see uh one way you, you can think, well, is this person, there's a new politician on the scene, are they kind of a, a strongman type? If they start talking about crisis politics and also their own victimhood um, and how they're a victim, but they're also a savior. Um, Berlusconi used to call himself the Jesus Christ of Italian politics because of that. So they take the hits for the nation, but they are also the only ones capable of saving the nation. And then every, anything that goes wrong when they mismanage things because, becomes a result of their kind of victimhood. So when coronavirus hit, it was very interesting to see the initial uh, reactions of world leaders. And so you had Bolsonaro and Trump who first tried to kind of deny it and saying it was like a little flu, right? And try to make it go away, manipulate statistics. And, and eventually Trump just, uh, Trump administration just gave up um, and they said, we're not going to even try and manage this and continue to have rallies. And this was his ego need to have the rallies that, that they are nothing without an audience. And so Trump's need to be on the campaign trail and to keep the bomb with his followers far outweighed his concern for public welfare. So in the case of Trump, it's a very, it's like a microcosm of all these dynamics. Um, and, and truly, the, the thing we need to realize about Trump is that um, because Americans have never had a foreign occupation or a dictatorship, they've used a democratic framework to interpret Trump. And this is wrong. Trump is not there to govern in a democratic sense. He's there to make money for Trump organization. He's there to build his personality cult and keep his followers. And he's there to stay in power. And the idea of public welfare or public goods is, is, is completely alien to him. Mm. But this was the thing that confused me about about the the, the 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 kind of strong men reaction to coronavirus was that kind of if you look back at other crises, you know, like the Reichstag fire or what Duarte has more contemporarily done in the Philippines, they've kind of used crisis as a way of um, expanding the reach of government. You know, emergency laws, more draconian yes. legislation. You know, the deployment of military on the streets and so on. But that that isn't what say a Bolsonaro or a Trump did with COVID, was it? I mean, like you, you would have thought that in a way the, the, the obvious reaction would have been an extension of government, you know, and therefore an extension of their own power into previously, you know, un kind of uh, uh, contested spaces of people's lives, you know, or un, un, un kind of, you know, places where government couldn't normally reach. But, but, but it was a weird way that they kind of actually withdrew government in a way from, from the pandemic and its management. Well, so we have to differentiate because they're uh, uh, very frighteningly, there is a, a parallel process going on with the help of his ideal co-conspirator, William Barr, the Department of Justice, who has completely politicized and purged the Department of Justice. And they have been setting up uh, since, uh, you know, Trump's been doing this since 2018, setting up a whole structure to label any uh, civic dissent, any protesters as terrorists. And we saw during the summer in reaction to the Black Lives Matter protests, he sent in the military. Um, there were people being bundled into unmarked cars like it was people, that's why people were talking about juntas and Pinochet. And, and the GOP went you know, along with this in, in great measure. Uh, there was Senator Tom Cotton who said, let's bring in the military you know, to turn the military on own people. So they are extending government in ways that are very frightening and I have I have zero doubt that if he were reelected, um, we would see this extension of government in, in ways that are very dire for journalistic freedoms and for the right to protest, the right to assemble. Um, all of this infrastructure is being uh, completed. With coronavirus, it's really, uh, Trump is not interested in devoting his time to good governance. And so they'd simply gave up and indeed uh, other, uh, governance priorities like keeping his personality cult weighed more, far more. And, and yes, this is destructive because he could have come out fairly 
easily as, you know, no one could perhaps tame coronavirus. We see in democracies, they're in lockdowns again, but he could have done a much better job, but he's not interested in doing that job. He's interested in other jobs. Um, we've spoken a lot about the kind of vulnerabilities of society to strong men and authoritarian rule, but could, could you talk a bit about some of the like resiliences which society have? What what, what, what typically are the characteristics of societies which kind of can either reject or recover from, from these kinds of power grabs? So this was, uh, at times this was not a fun book to write. Um, there was a lot of grim stories of, you know, institutionalized uh, racism and sexual abuse and all of this. So when I got to the resistance chapter, it, and there is acts of resistance, resistance are in every chapter, it's threaded throughout, but um, it, was a, it was inspiring to see the forms of resistance and how over a century um, there are techniques that continue. Um, and, and depending on the situation, which e each society can vary in the amount of policing that there is, but you know, small acts, um, sometimes res resistance is what you don't do. Um, you, you, don't, you don't do the Hitler salute. You don't show up to the fascist youth group. Um, but many times uh, the core of resistance, even in our digital era, and I, I look at how certain um, key moments, cinematic moments of resistance where the police break down your door and you have to hide your documents. Nowadays, like in the 20th century, we couldn't really see that because uh, we didn't have social media. Nowadays, like in Russia, when, when uh, critics of Putin, you know, the police come to their door, they're filming it and they're streaming it live. And I recount uh, one uh, critic who uh, filmed his, uh, a drone carrying his hard drive out the window to a friend's house to save his contacts. So I try and have these examples in the book of how things have changed and how things have stayed the same. And so the book, each chapter goes over a hundred years and talks about a different uh, either instrument of rule like propaganda or res the resistance chapter. So, but the core of resistance remains bodies coming together to reclaim public space, to speak back publicly to the ruler, but also to his allies and also to foreign lenders. And this kind of nonviolent mass protest is at the right time when, a, when a, 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 a leader is losing his power. We have Belarus today as an example. Um, it's highly effective. And there are, there are kind of rituals that can go on um, that get recycled. And this was very inspiring. Um, during the fall of communism, there was a, a ritual called the Baltic Way where everybody held hands across several states. And in 2019 in Hong Kong, protesters revived this and paid homage to it by linking hands. So, so I think you know, the, the reader will have a lot of sense of the range of resistance. Um, and it's not, some is violent and the most effective has been nonviolent. Well, we are gonna come back to loss of power and Trump in just one second, because I think people listening to this will badly want to know your thoughts about how um, we can have a roadmap of sorts from history about what's gonna happen next and, and, and where it's all gonna go. But before we do that, one final question about, um, you know, resilience and vulnerability, and, uh, and that's around technology. Um, because we, we seem to be faced with quite a kind of complicated story now about technology, both in some cases, kind of heralding and, and aiding despotisms and strong men and their cults of personality, I suppose, in particular. Um, but then also, of course, being an absolute kind of endemic um, uh, kind of part of the story of resistance and protests. How, how do you see that playing out now in terms of changing the kind of playing field um, upon which, you know, strong men um, kind of operate? Yeah, the big debate about whether um, digital media help or uh, harm the strong men is, is, is going to be ongoing. And, um, you know, for every time, uh, I mean, obviously, uh, rulers like Putin and Erdogan have been extremely able in blocking um, you know, platforms that they very quickly that are going to do them damage. But the resilience is in the workarounds that people find. And you saw this in Hong Kong. Again, I don't talk about Chinese communism, but Hong Kong where they, they, they uh, took advantage of Tinder or Apple's airdrop to get around 
uh, these platforms that that were that were banned. So that kind of in, inventiveness will continue. Um, but clearly, when I uh, studied the story of Trump's rise and his use of Facebook, and he actually used a kind of e-commerce model, and the product was Trump, and the the means by which he uh, publicized his product was Facebook mostly. And I, the reader will find the exact number here, but tens of millions of ads were taken out by the Trump campaign on Facebook versus about 60,000 by the Clinton campaign. So the Trump was, was so savvy in using digital media. And this is one, perhaps the only thing that Kushner <laughs> um, got right uh, and, and pushed for. Um, so, so Facebook and certainly Twitter have been a kind of co-author, one could say, of the Trump presidency. Um, the, the Facebook in the ascendant phase uh, and Twitter in the maintenance of power and both Trump and Bolsonaro use their personal accounts. And when Trump leaves office, if he does, he will retain that personal account and thus will retain his, his, it's integral to his personality cult. Well, coming now then finally to Trump and loss of power. Um, how close has Trump got to genuinely shaking the foundations of American democracy? Because I guess there, there's a kind of counter view here, which says, okay, Trump did lots of really horrible things. Um, he was certainly extremely populist. He certainly himself doesn't seem to betray any great love of, of democracy, but the, the basic institutions and the norms and the culture and, the, and fundamentally the separations of power within American government have remained strong and they will eventually be the things that get rid of Trump. So um, I, I would beg to differ a bit uh, with that because Trump has been successful uh, in politicizing the federal bureaucracy, starting with the Department of Justice, the Department of State. There have been hundreds of thousands of civil servants who have left uh, and have been replaced by ideologues, by zealots, by corrupt people who will do Trump's bidding. And the number of judges Trump has appointed, hundreds of judges at every level. We hear most about the Supreme Court. So, there are statements from, uh, you know, Democratic senators and political analysts that talk about the independence of the judiciary and the, the kind of independence of the three branches has been badly harmed by Trump. And in the case of the judges, uh, it's going to take many years to recover this. And this is why, of course, the conservative, the GOP, that was one of the things that that was part of the pact and also for evangelical Christians who've been very important. Uh, so we, we haven't begun to assess the damage that Donald Trump has done mm -hmm. to institutions, to again, the federal bureaucracy. It, it's, it might seem a very boring topic, but it's absolutely key to the implementation of policy, to the imposition of a certain ideology. So the Office of Civil Rights, um, civil rights used to mean a uh, so struggle for you know, racial equity for, for economic equity. Um, and now it, it's, it's the, uh, the official office of civil rights is about protecting the, um, the rights of white Christians um, who shouldn't be and, and trying to erase the separation of church and state. And some of the men who are most influential and are now uh, colluding with this power grab like William Barr and Mike Pompeo uh, Barr is a Catholic with uh, links to Opus Dei, and Pompeo is an evangelical Christian, but they both uh, see the ideal form of government as one that uh, doesn't have much room for separation of church and state. So I think that we underestimate Trump at our peril. So thinking especially about the independence of a judiciary, which I suppose is kind of a question which has never been more important nor more asked than, than really just about now, um, how confident are you that the kind of mechanisms of government and the judiciary will eventually, and not eventually, I mean really quite soon, kind of <laughs> actually cause Trump to leave power? 
Well, you know, the, the, there's various, you can game this out in various ways. And one, uh, one end point is the Supreme Court gets involved. And that's exactly why they rushed through the appointment of Amy Cone, Coney Barrett uh, to have this majority. So, so in that, if it goes to that end, then um, he may be successful. I'm not one of the people who are talking about coups. I like to be, as somebody who immersed themselves in coups for years and has the whole third of the book is on coup, the era of coups. I like to be careful with my language, um, but there is definitely an attempt to uh, illegally stay in power with, with the help of the judiciary. And so now, um, just as Trump's propaganda machine is waging psychological warfare on Americans, telling them that the election was illegitimate, the judicial mechanism with Barr at the head is trying to reopen vote counts and claim that uh, the other day, he, the DOJ said that, oh, well, we can't decide the election. I forgot what state it was because the votes are now under audit. So this, this is where you go back to crisis. This, creation of a, of a period of prolonged crisis. Um, and, and then will we have civil unrest? And then you have this parallel process of being able to use the state um, to label protesters in the streets as terrorists and arrest them. So there are many outcomes. I can't tell you where it's going to go, but we can say that they've set up for every eventuality um, and there's nothing that they won't do to try and remain in power. Okay, well, Ruth, my, my, my last question is about healing. Um, so, so let's kind of assume that Trump is eventually ousted from the White House, um, whether he admits the loss or not. Um, of course, the kind of rhetoric is kind of beginning to shift now towards trying to begin to heal the kind of partisan chasms which have opened up over, over uh, the last, well, I mean, for, for, for well over a decade now. Yes. Um, how, how, how do we begin, if we are to see Trump as a strong man and therefore his agenda is essentially being anti-democratic by its very nature, how do we begin to kind of find common ground, I suppose, with the 70 odd million Americans, not to mention the many other people around the world that saw something in his message or something in his agenda? Because um, I, I guess my worry is that if you simply portraying him as a strong man for any kind of small D Democrat kind of just creates basically a visage that we just have to resist and fight. Like there's no other, there's, there's no other really option. So, so what other options are there for us to, to, to try and find some kind of way of, of moving closer to people on the other side of the aisle? So um, assuming he leaves and then we can have turn the page. And of course the way that Biden is being, which is kind of low key, decent, not giving into this panic, not embracing the crisis we fight you but being a calm assurances that he will be see, he will be in government, you know, in, at the end of January, are just what we need because people are very exhausted. But I, I actually I end the book on a really hopeful note um, that could even seem Pollyannish to some uh, about the importance of love and the various platforms of uh, in, in in Erdogan's Turkey, uh, Imam Oglu who. Who, ran, who successfully won the, as mayor of Istanbul, had a platform of radical love to combat populist polarization. And reaching out to the other side has never been more important. And I'm an admirer of uh, Pete Buttigieg, who goes on Fox News every single day and talks to them. And he is able in his, the way he is, uh, a veteran, um, he's able to reach them. And we don't really have another choice. I think one of the last sentences of the book is that if when you're at a crossroads, you either turn away from each other, which is what men like Trump want, or you try and build bridges. And if you're going to be a functioning nation, a productive nation, and you're going to heal, uh, and again, this polarization started well before Trump, he just weaponized it. There's really no other option. Um, so that's how I conclude the book with examples of people from uh, Erdogan's Turkey and Putin's Russia who are 
coming around to the same way of thinking. And I think that we need to uh, apply this in the States as well. Well, uh, Radhikula, what better place uh, than that to leave such a great discussion? Ruth, thank you so much. Um, this has been so eye-opening and, and truly revelatory. Um, I'm Carmela, and you've been listening to Intelligence Squared. Thank you.